I, I want to introduce our next two speakers, Drs. Laura Cabrera and Jennifer Kushner. And um, they are great colleagues, partners in crime for many years with all of us. Um, one's my wife, so I'm very fond of her. Uh, but I'm also incredibly fond of Jen. And the three of us have been working together for a long time. And, and it's one of, the, one of my favorite projects that I've ever worked on, mostly because of these two. So um, Jen has held and, and driven the vision of this thing for years, and, and it's become more, more clear over time under her leadership. And Laura is, uh, among many other things, single-handedly responsible for making these ideas translatable and accessible and understandable, and in particular for making me presentable. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, without further ado, I will pass it over to Laura and Jen, Doctors Kushner and uh, Cabrera. I think Jen. All right. So, returning to our conference theme way back from this morning, which is Think X. We wanted to share with you um, our next Think X, our really our next great Think X, and something we've been really excited about and working on a bit um, as we've gone along, and that's Think Evaluation. Um, so systems thinking applied to evaluation. Why, you might ask, why that as a Think X? Well, evaluation is universally important across sectors, across organization types, across disciplines in this room today. Many of you have talked about communicating value or impact or evaluating learning. And really, evaluation is the primary means by which we demonstrate our impact, communicate our value, and uh, mostly evolve our efforts. It's that feedback loop, um, mental model to real world. And because, uh, in particular, Laura and I um, have long believed we can do it better, more robustly, with more accuracy, kind of the field of evaluation, um, if you will. So we're excited about Think Evaluation. And we've talked about already the challenges that we face today are complex. They're multifaceted, they're VUCA. Um, Derek talked about VUCA earlier. The interventions and policies um, are also equally complex. So the question is, how do we capture complexity in our efforts to measure the success of our interventions? How do we actually integrate that complexity within our evaluation practice? And how do we use evaluation results to be more adaptive in real time, rather than waiting until the fifth year of a fifth year cycle of something to then try to figure out something fundamentally didn't work? So as maybe an entry point into systems evaluation, we want to start with logic models. Um, this may look very familiar to you. Don't worry about the text. Really, we're going to be paying attention to the structure here. Logic models are one of the most popular tools in evaluation today. Many of you use them or have heard of them. Um, again, they're popular across um, funding agencies, sectors, organization types. And they're used by program developers and program designers. Uh, to determine the suite of activities that are hopefully intended to accomplish desired results. And they're used by program staff and by evaluators to determine if those activities are really uh, making progress and taking place toward those desired results as planned. Yet, there's a problem. <laughs> um, so in spite of their popularity, logic models actually have uh, several shortcomings. They're really not the silver bullet that we think they are and hope they'll be. They promise to be. Um, they have some significant limitations. So we wanted to um, point out or highlight three specific shortcomings of logic models, um, which will lead us into the, the future. So one of those is that it's a, it's a really simplified tool um, that's used to measure complex phenomena. So if you think about everything you've heard today, a lot of wicked problems and even everyday problems, it's a really simplified tool and we'll get into that a little bit more. But we're, in essence, we're usually, if we're talking about um, real world issues, they're complex issues and so there's a sort of a mismatch there. 
Often there's a failure to articulate sound pro program logic, right? So the name logic model is intended to um, illustrate sound program logic and this tool doesn't really help us do that very well as they are typically used. And they hide a lot of the relationships that are really core to a theory of change. So we're gonna just look at a traditional logic model for a second. Um, and again, don't worry about the words. Um, structurally, which are what the colors are, structurally, they're made up of three core functional parts. The context, which you see in red, and that's the number one. The program, which is number two and green. And outcomes or results, which is three and purple. So I'm going to come back to the shortcoming, shortcomings two and three. Failure to articulate sound program logic and the hidden relationships. So first, the hidden relationships. This simplified linear structure of a traditional logic model is made up of assumed causal relationships, linear sequential, really short-term outcomes lead to medium-term, long-term, et cetera. So many of you are familiar with this, right? And they often don't really reflect the intricacies of the program or the complexity of the real-world issues that the program's trying to address. And as we said, logic models are intended to cultivate program logic. They're a tool to help you illustrate and communicate with other people or with your team collaborators, articulate your program logic. But often they're really quite binary. They rely on if-then sort of um, relationships and those relationships are not made explicit or sort of um, they're assumed. So um, Laura will talk a little bit more about this, but what we're offering as we look forward is that logic models as they are traditional logic modeling um, can really be bolstered by apl applying multivalent logic as opposed to binary logic. So DSRP would be an example of multivalent logic. Another issue um, is that the logic for why certain activities could or should lead to certain kinds of outcomes has not been grounded in evidence, right? So I say uh, assumed causal relationships, often we are not articulating what that evidence base is or even what our starting um, set of assumptions are about the relationship between activities and results we can't usually see what that evidence base is, whether it's something, um, there's a big body of literature about it or whether it's just our starting um, hunch that we, th we think a couple of things, a couple activities we do will lead to certain outcomes. So we simply say, if we do this, then that should happen. The logic model itself does not offer up much real estate for this important glue in one's theory of change or program logic. So, if you look at this particular illustration, we carved out sort of a small sliver where the red is, where it says evidence, to illustrate where that evidence really should be, and that is usually missing. And that's really um, an issue because the structural errors in the logic model itself create structural errors in our thinking. We bypass the rationale for why we do what we do and are thus really um, easily misled into collecting the wrong data. <laughs> And therefore, we're not really fully communicating or even understanding the impact of what we're doing. So why do we not do diligence to connecting the program or program effort to desired outcomes through the articulation of evidence? Simple question. Even though that this is actually the most powerful part of the model. I'd offer that it's hard. It's hard to do, it can seem overwhelming, and particularly when we're faced with social phenomena and wicked problems. So this particular image shows that the dog is causing the water to splash. It's observable causality. This is what we seek when we're um, evaluating programs. So taking this a step further, our strongest case for the value and impact of our programs are direct measures. Observable causality is a direct measure. We can literally see if this dog jump, then that splash, right? We've got observable causality. The dog jumps, we see a splash. That's a direct measure. Often, rather than finding a simple and perhaps singular direct measure, we tend to piece together a bunch of indirect measures, such as self-reports, of learning after workshops and try to create a composite picture that helps us get closer to knowing if what we did resulted in what we wanted. 
those composite pictures are still less accurate than direct measures. They're getting closer, but they're not as accurate. They're suggestive, but not definitive. I'm gonna come back to shortcoming number one, which was, I said that it was a simplified tool to measure a complex phenomena. Traditional logic models tend to clump and thus hide the contextual richness that should be really in embedded inside the program logic or theory of change. So that's all that red stuff. In traditional mo um, logic modeling, that context piece you might know of as situation, assumptions, external factors, et cetera. And this image really depicts that we treat them a little bit like a metaphorical closet where we dump all the stuff that we don't want to get rid of, but we don't really know what to do with. So it's that sort of stuff that tends to be hanging out there and really isn't embedded inside our theory of change or our program logic. And we do this in part um, to simplify. Um, but you can see even in this traditional logic model format, these variables are often even on the periphery structurally of the actual theory of change. So in the end, logic, traditional logic models tend not to be an accurate model of the program really at all. They don't represent the program and all its in intricacies. Um, and it really, what we miss is the actual logic and structure um, of the tool itself. A Couple more thoughts, and then we have the exciting future coming up. Um, so not to completely, um, throw out logic models. We want to point out some of the shortcomings. Um, also, traditionally, logic models often depict isolated efforts that could be, you know, at a couple of different scales, but they provide a local view of what a singular effort is trying to do. And you can say singular effort is my distinct program that I'm doing, or maybe it's even clumped up a little higher. But it's still a pretty local view, and they tend to be pretty isolated. My particular world that I'm in is doing this, you know, doing these activities to bring about these results. But in reality, however, no programmatic effort is actually ever really isolated, right? It's built on existing knowledge and work, and it's situated within a larger context of factors and relationships. It's this larger context that's important in building the larger knowledge base grounded in evidence across distinct but related efforts. When we can see all these isolated efforts and local, prob uh, local programs in relationship to each other, through the synergistic activities, mutually reinforcing activities and shared outcomes, we have collective impact. So the idea with this illustration is um, all these distinct and local efforts become, as we bring them into a more of a system view, mutually reinforcing and we can start to understand more deeply the collective impact that as we seek to understand the distinctions and relationships, et cetera, within this larger system, um, collective impact emerges uh, as a as an outcome of this larger system dynamic. And now we have the solution <laughs> to this horrible a, situation. <laughs> we have a proposed solution, right? Yeah. It's all a hypothesis always, right? Okay, thank you, Jen, for that. That was great. Um, so then the question is, what are we gonna do? We're gonna need a new model, um, uh, a new model that we're lovingly called SysEval, Systems Evaluation, and it's really comprised of networked logic models. Um, it's a networked causal model um, to understand, because to understand SysEval, we need to focus on the relationship between the two levels that Jen was talking about, the local or the program level, and the global level, which is going to be many programs who have some meaningful connections that haven't yet been articulated or, ex or explicated, but that can then lead to mutual reinforcing activities um, and a, and, an, and a real measure of col collective impact, collective action. So um, when we think about this, think about one singular sort of causal area is one programmatic effort with one chain of evidence or causal, causal loop. And, and we want to talk about also how do we create a model that allows for the importance and, and adds robustness to the local view, but also allows us to then um, articulate and connect a global view across many programs that may be similar in some ways. Does that make sense? Good. I mean, it's, this is a great graphic, right? <laughs> Simple. I mean, yeah, you've been sitting in a windowless room for five hours, so we needed to keep it simple. 
So this is going to be really hard for you to read. But if you find, so for example, that your program and its evaluation doesn't fit within the sort of linear confines of a tr traditional logic model, there is a way to think about it differently. And the solution that you have shouldn't defy logic. It just should be based on a different kind of logic, a non-binary or a multivalent form of logic. Um, and this is, this is, uh, this multivalency allows for those infinite shades of grays, the intricacies, the nuances of the context of a program, and it's, it's just quite simply more based on reality, which is the whole goal of systems thinking, to align our mental models, our models of evaluation with the reality of the things that we're actually interacting with, the systems we're working with. And we need to remember that most things exist not in a linear causal relationship, but within webs of causality, whether it's one singular program or many programs all at once. So this new model that we, um, we are starting to articulate and have started a paper on that's going to be published soon, hopefully, um, it uses a sort of complex adaptive system perspective in which programs, um, which we consider just to be one type of system, are dynamic. And it includes many sort of nonlinear causal relationships that bring about the emergent behavior of the system itself. And that can happen across scale at the local level or the global, le global level. Did I say global? I mean global. <laughs> are, we, are we dimming the lights? I think it's that one by Deb. Yeah, it's just really hard to read. Maybe that one. Just the front lights might make any sense. Maybe I can just highlight the structure of the map. I can tell you sort of what's on the map. So, um, so in this map right here is our program as in one of the columns of a traditional logic model. This is our program. What are we going to do? And it's comprised of a couple of parts in this particular representation. It could have many parts, but it has several activities within that program. Those activities are connected through evidence to what we're hoping we're going to see, the result or the outcomes, which is that other column in a traditional logic model, those number two and number three, which were green and blue. So this was the green and this was the blue. And what you'll see is that we have this critical feedback relationship at this, and this is at the local level right now, one program, which is how will we capture evidence of a causal relationship between what we're doing and what we're hoping to see and also, how will we take what we've learned, this evidence, and this knowledge that we're gaining through this process to feed back in real time, as much as humanly possible, into improving the program as we're delivering the program, not at it only at the five-year mark of a five-year plan. But how do we constantly use real-world feedback, real time, to improve our programmatic efforts and to bolster up the kinds of evidence that we're seeking? And this over here represents several different types, several different outcomes, um, which means many of you know that any given program activity does not necessarily have a one-to-one -one relationship with an outcome. We have several, sometimes we have one activity that connects to several outcomes. We have one activity that is specifically designed for one desired outcome. But we need to be very flexible in the model because that's how programs actually exist in the real world. We also have um, this, if, if this is our series of outcomes, we have to um, use everything we've learned in a summative way as evidence to the effect that we were trying to have on a, a problem statement, a condition that we were trying to solve or ameliorate through our programmatic efforts in, the, in, in and of itself. So this outcomes box, what we were hoping to see, is comprised of three parts that exist in a relationship. So it's what we're actually seeing outcomes at the local level as as evidence to the global level of what we are doing to impact the condition. That's the part that connects in a network causal diagram, which I'll show you later in a minute. Does that make sense structurally? Yes. OK. Um, so this is, this is what we hope to be a model that offers both simplicity and complexity simultaneously. And um, we're trying to produce a model that accurately reflects reflects the reality of program efforts and program planning. And also, we believe that it will serve as a far more effective communication tool in the necessary conversations that are going to have to happen across all the stakeholders, internal and external to the program. So what I want to do is I want to show you a little bit more deeply into this map. It's hard to see, but see this sort of gray, this gray square that's alluding to there's another map up here. Well, there is. And that is where we modeled 
um, where we modeled our definition of evidence or what we mean by um, how are we going to make it more robust. And one of the things that Derek and I and Jen have talked a lot about over the course of our work is this, um, we've created this thing called the method matching matrix, which is hard to say at 3.30 at this, in this room at this moment. But it's a method mat matching matrix, which means we want to make sure that there is a very particular relationship between the condition of knowledge, meaning the state of what we know about whatever topic we're, we're working on, whether it's hunger or water education or any kind of intervention. Sometimes, you know, we, we know very little. Sometimes we know a lot about a given topic. And there needs to be a relationship between how much we know about that condition, that knowledge, and the methods we choose to evaluate them. Meaning, if you don't know much at all about the topic that you're starting to try to investigate, your most, your most reasonable source of uh, a method for gathering data is going to land down here in this, in this area, which is observational work, case study work, and at times quasi-experimental designs. As you're, as, you're, as you're gaining more confidence in what you know about that phenomenon, you're going to move into this gray box, which is more experimental designs, randomized designs, random controlled trials, and then, of course, the granddaddy of it all, which is once you really, really have an established research base, like you will find in a lot of public health issues, you can move into meta-analysis and RCTs, which are considered sort of the gold standard of, of methods. So when you're trying to de design an evaluation, we want to ask ourselves, um, what are we studying? How much do we know about it? Um, how much do we know about the, the proposed relationship between what we're proposing to do and what we're hoping to see? And therefore, what types of evidence do we need to seek? And what kind of methods do we need to relate to that kind of evidence that we're trying to seek? And it's answering those questions that will let you really um, come up with a not only a mental model of your program that's realistic, but a set of methods and tools that will really um, give you leverage into understanding that system with great robustness and then actually have more credible evidence and I would say reliable results in terms of your outcomes. So, it, you know, in the course of a program and your work in a certain program, the relationship between your activities and outcomes should get more evidence-based, triangulated, and robust because you're following this sort of methodological continuum based on what you're knowing through the course of the work. So this is a cool video that my favorite tech guy made for me. And this is to show you the global view. So what you need to think about is that each one of these boxes here is a program. That's the local view. So everything I showed you applies to the local view. So say we have three programs, one, two, and three. Right now, we can look at all of these programs in isolation. But like Jen was saying, we really need to start to try to build networks of understanding across the programs. So right now, I'm going to start it back over because I got ahead of myself. Let me show you what we're doing. So right now, we're going to look at this map. And right now, this is one program, and it's evidence-based to, to outcomes and then to another outcome. Here's another program, evidence to outcomes, a third program, evidence to outcomes. So this is all work. Now we're looking. This is one program that was funded by one funder. This is funder two, who's involved in two programs. Funder three is involved only in that. This. These poor little boxes have no funding. We know from networking them. We know that these are areas that need some more attention. And then um, we're also identifying gaps in research. This is the global view, collective impact, for this outcome. This is the global view for this outcome. Sorry, this outcome. So what we're seeing is across a network of programs, if you imagine, for example, in fact, one of the things that I worked on many, many years ago that I actually might have met Derek around this time was we were, we were working on an NSF grant, and the purpose of that grant was entirely to do just this, to try to figure out across all of the STEM programs in the country, what is the, what are, what, how can we determine the collective impact of those? Because at that time, every single STEM program across the country was doing an isolated program level evaluation. And they said, well, 
at some point we need to understand what is the collective impact of all of that funding, all of that effort. And so that's when we actually started to think about the method match matching matrix and what would it look like to articulate a model of how you do that? How do you assess collective impact? And so this is the kind of thing that we were talking about. So the benefits of this kind of a model at the local level are that you have um, much more evidence of your own program's impact. Um, you will, the results of your work, which become a research base, will then become, gosh, I gotta stop doing that. They'll become more accessible and knowable by people who may be doing similar types of research. So your, your research base can become also a research base to another program, which gives you powerful partnerships, more ways for collaboration and funding. Um, it will tell you where you could look for funding. Um, and it could also maybe show you over time where you could have very powerful partnerships across that research base that you're developing that might also fit into somebody else's research base, even though they may be having a different outcome they're seeking, they might be still basing some of their work on the same research, if that makes sense. So you can think about like self-esteem and a mountain climbing program. Well, they might have different outcomes, but they might be looking at the same bodies of research. So you get some mutual reinforcing um, and collective impact opportunities there. At the global level, you're going, to, you're going to really start to have both qualitative and quantitative ways to measure mutually reinforcing activities and collective impact across programs, which is really important, I think, as we get up into the national level of things and that bird's eye view of what are we doing with STEM? Are we actually making a difference? We have hundreds of programs across the country, but how do we know what we're doing? Also, what's important is this idea of gap analysis. So gap analysis. So when you look at a networked map and you can see nodes that are isolated or strings of research that are sort of living out in left field, you'll know that maybe that's where we need to spend some effort with funding or seeking evidence or um, trying to really do some more robust research around those areas that are sort of isolated but could be connected with other pieces of work. Um, it also gives a nice bigger picture view of efforts. And it will also, at a global level, lead to more powerful partnerships across national level or national scale programs. So one of the things that's really exciting to, um, to all of us on this team is we've started to realize, and this is why I think Jen says ThinkX is, for us, the ThinkWater team for this next year of our work is going to be focused a lot on evaluation, is through through the development of this mapping software, which you've seen all of the fellows in, in, inside of their presentations, we've realized that we can actually build an automated, an automated way of generating the same kind of content that you need in a logic model, but that's based on a multivalent logic and that is as easy to use as a tradi traditional logic model, but that will, in the end, lead you to a more robust and systematic understanding of how to run your program and how to assess the results. So I know this is really hard to read, so I won't read it, but um, I'll read it a little bit. So basically you would say, this would be an actual computer interface, much like you do online in Excel sheets with logic models, where you'd articulate your logic, the problem, the causes. It would literally walk you through these questions, and at the end of using this, this template, it would generate a very basic map of your theory of change using the software. And from there, you can start to identify gaps and figure out where you want to make your efforts to improve your, your work and your program. Does that make sense? Yes? Somebody has to talk to me. Say yes. OK, so the big question, and, and then we'll move into the, the last piece of this. Um, people always say, what is systems evaluation? It's, in a, you know, in an elevator speech, it's basically local scale program activities and outcomes that are causal change embedded in a context, which is all of that red stuff that um, Jen was referring to, that consists of other chains that together form that sort of global scale web of causality around a particular outcome you're trying to seek. And it leads to mutual reinforcing activities and really gives you an, an idea of collective impact. So it's the awareness of that sort of macro scale uh, web of ca causality that you know provides opportunities for the higher fidelity data, partnership, research, efficiency, and of course our favorite funding. Right? We all love funding. So um, we're going to close that out. Derek Cabrera, we're closing this out, and um, 
If you have more questions about systems evaluation, Jen and I are taking the lead on that project. We welcome any questions. We love new partners, new thoughts, new ideas. It's a piece of work that's really exciting to both of us because we have sort of lived and trudged through <laughs> new logic models for unfortunately like 20 years now. We've got a, I shouldn't say that out loud, for a long time. What we want to do is now, um, unfortunately, we're going to have to say goodbye to our incredibly generous live stream audience and then we're going to start having a discussion here in this room for a little bit that you're going to jump off right yes all right so say goodbye to the live stream everybody bye live stream bye.